Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our webinar on technical assistance, where we hope to demonstrate that it is the wealth enabler for buildings. I'm delighted to uh, be hosting this uh, webinar. I'm Adrian Joyce, the director of the Renovate Europe campaign, and I'm delighted to have the support of our three co-hosts, the Caisse de Depot from France, Federine, uh, the European Organization, and Energy Cities. I also think that this is a very timely um, webinar because with the huge ambition that's now being shown at EU level around the need for renovation of buildings, we in the Renovate Europe campaign have realized that technical assistance and project development assistance is absolutely crucial to rolling out energy renovation at the right depth and rate. The good news is that there's plenty of technical assistance available and plenty of options for national governments, local governments, even for public bodies to source technical assistance uh, from the EU level. And it is looking into that that we will do this morning, where we have a great uh, set of speakers from the European Commission, from local level, uh, from stakeholder level, to give us real examples of what's out there and what's available for uh, all of you to use to make energy renovation and the renovation wave strategy a great success across the EU. One point I'd like to make in general about energy efficiency renovations is that by reducing the energy demand of a building, you reduce the amount of energy needed to create healthy, comfortable conditions in the building. This means that even if the unit price of energy goes up, there is a buffer for people throughout the life cycle of the building, the use life cycle of the building, to protect them against price hikes in the energy sector, which is something that we see is happening today. So without further ado, I will just give you some guidance. Um, as the audience, you will not be able to intervene verbally, but we are looking forward to having your active participation through questions that you can place in the chat box. Uh, they will be uh, sifted and moderated by myself and my staff. And uh, during the Q&A sessions, I hope to rely on your questions so that as moderator, I don't have to uh, put questions to our speakers. Other than that, yes, the PowerPoints will be distributed later. There's already a handout included in the dialogue box. It's our own guide to the technical support instrument from DG Reform. And the recording of this webinar will be made public on our website in due course. But before we get going, we were very interested to find out what you, our audience, think of uh, technical assistance. So we've prepared a quick poll. If we go to the poll after beauty, what we'd like you to do is just choose one option so we get an idea about what our audience thinks is the most important element of technical assistance. So as you can see, and you can launch the poll, I think, uh, Aphrodite, we've asked the question, what does technical assistance mean to you? And we are asking you to just select one of these five options. Does it mean targeted aid with the analysis of barriers and needs? Does it mean engineering and project advice for local authorities? Does it mean external expert help for the design and I would say implementation of renovation programs? Does it mean explanation and sourcing of funding opportunities? Or does it mean boosting the number and skills of personnel? So you can simply click uh, on your choice. Uh, organizers and panelists can't vote. And we will, in a moment, uh, see uh, what the audience uh, considers technical assist assistance uh, to be. Like all good polls, choose the one that's closest to your understanding of technical assistance. And I now rely on my colleague to um, put up the result once enough of our now 32 participants have uh, answered. So how are we doing? 
Are we getting some answers, Aphrodite? Yes, so 73% have voted. Great. Well, I think we can go then to the results, if, we, if that can be shown. Aha. Okay, so there's almost a tie between engineering and project advice for local authorities and external expert help for the design uh, and, as I said, implementation of renovation programs. Whereas, interestingly, on funding, uh, that's got the lowest uh, percentage. And actually, here at European level, we talk a great deal about how complex funding opportunities are to understand. And indeed, technical assistance in many cases has been focused towards that point. So interesting, uh, and I hope uh, my panelists uh, have found that instructive to see uh, what the audience considers uh, technical assistance to be. So next slide, please, because without further ado, I'm absolutely delighted to uh, introduce our first speaker. It's Matthew Fitcher from uh, the DG Regio, who has had a uh, great number of years experience with the multi-annual financial framework. Matthew, over to you. And uh, I know it's a tough ask, but 10 minutes, please, uh, to go through your presentation. That's the floor. So Matthew, you're still muted. We can't hear you. Now it works, okay. Yeah, good morning. Um, thanks for the invitation and giving uh, me the opportunity to speak um, about uh, the role of, of technical assistance and also the, 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 the learnings from the, the EU budget and so giving you perspective, an EU budget perspective and also insisting on uh, why and how technical assistance is uh, uh, important and especially how to prioritize it in, um, in, in the use of, of EU funding. So without further ado, let's start. Next slide, um, please. I will um, give you a bit of a feedback on uh, what we have learned. So from the side, I would say of cohesion policy, but even abroad of the perspective of, of the, the, the EU budget and the European Commission in terms of uh, supporting um, uh, renovation, building renovation. I think you're all aware of the renovation for way for Europe document that was uh, recently adopted and I think there it's crystal clear that um, a whole sub chapter is targeted at the, the role of technical assistance uh, and capacities and all the, the, the issues that uh, are highlighted, so the obstacles to building renovation. And this stems very much uh, from uh, the input uh, we shared in this work and we have uh, really a decade of cohesion policy support to, to building renovation, even a bit more. This all started in the years 2008-2009 as a reaction to the financial and economic crisis back then. What we see and what we um, can conclude after this quite long time on supporting uh, building renovations through our funding is that money is really not enough. And I think that's broadly shared that lack of capacities, expertise and skills, they are often a central hurdle to, to large scale renovation programs. Second, um, that there is really a, a diversity of technical assistance needs, and I will come back to that in the a, in a, in a next slide. It's about administrative capacities, it's about uh, financial expertise, it's about building project pipelines, and it's also, for instance, about the whole regulatory framework. So technical assistance is not just <clears throat> one focused element, but it is very broad, and I think this we all need to, to keep in mind. Another point we see as a... Um, the key learning and actually success factor is that the TEA has to be really fully integrated in the energy efficiency strategy, which is unfortunately often not the case. It should not just be um, a side point uh, that uh, the, the program managers and developers just think about if there is a little bit of time and, and resources available. Extremely important as well is that um, one should look at the sectoral TA, so the C TA that is uh, focused at building renovation uh, together with the more horizontal technical assistance. So technical assistance that, for instance, is provided to administrations in general, 
um, to, to public and uh, private organizations in general, not just in energy, often they work hand in hand. Uh, there is the, really the need for tailor-made support. Uh, the energy landscape is very is a, is a national, regional one, and so uh, one TA support working in one uh, place wouldn't uh, maybe work in another place. And of course, the local characteristics play an extremely important role. Very important, and that's often forgotten. It really takes time to implement technical assistance. Uh, first to to design it, to implement it, and especially to see results. This needs to be taken into account, but it works. And I think that's really a positive message. We see it from like the cohesion policy perspective, but also other strands where technical assistance is implemented, it makes a difference. Of course, you would need to wait a couple of years to really see major differences in the implementation. Uh, but it often, uh, if not in, and in all cases, makes a difference on the ground. Next slide, please. What uh, I want to insist now is uh, why we should actually look at technical assistance for building renovation. Uh, first, because there are really a lot of capacity issues related on building renovation. Second, um, and the Fit for 55 package even emphasizes this further, what needs to be delivered by 2030 and 2050 is really very ambitious. So the business as usual approach will clearly not uh, be sufficient. The learning by doing approach also will not work, meaning the natural improvement of capacities in, in the building renovation area will take much too long. So we have to take this area really seriously and invest in, uh, in capacities across the board. One of the reasons also is that a lack of uh, capacities or inadequate capacities uh, would also mean locally, regionally, that uh, available finance, whether public or private, could be missed. And now there are really uh, broad opportunities in terms of available finance, not least from uh, the European perspective, to be targeted in uh, building renovation. And so we need to make sure that capacities are there to have the matching with the funding. The last point, which is often forgotten also, is that we have to make sure that all organizations and stakeholders are really up to the latest developments. There are constantly or quite frequently new regulations, there are new financial approaches which are developed, there are new technologies and materials coming onto the market. And this means that all the people involved in building renovation have to be up to this latest development. Next slide, please. <clears throat> This is a quick um, slide just to show you the different uh, elements that uh, are part of building renovation and where also one could intervene in terms of technical assistance. And I think it relates with the poll you have just shown that technical assistance is very diverse. And this means it's about uh, financial aspects, it's about the enabling framework, the involvement of, of partners, so the, the, the stakeholders working in this area, the project pipeline, of course, capacities in public and, and, and private entities. It's also very much, and that's often forgotten, about uh, having an inclusive approach, so working with the people, the home, the households. And uh, last but not least, uh, a key focus also should be more and more on, on the social dimension, so just transition and leaving no one behind. So this means that you need to look at um, uh, technical assistance and capacities from these different angles and develop TA where it is most needed. And this is, uh, next slide, this is um, what I want to emphasize in the way to, to go ahead, which what is first needed and is often lacking is this analytical review uh, to be done at local, regional, and even national level to identify the very capacity issues. It, some have it more in, in the public body side, others on the financial side, and others uh, more in terms of, of, of partnership. What is really needed as well is uh, to develop a strategic approach to capacity building. So it should be really center stage in very close link with the overall approach to, uh, to building uh, renovation. And their anticipation is really critically important. As I said, we, we are in a fast evolving uh, framework of legislation and, and market developments. And this means that capacities have to be linked with this, um, evaluate, with this evolving framework. Extremely important also, which can be a good way ahead, is to test and pilot 
some um, first uh, TA schemes at a smaller scale to then disseminate it at a, at a larger uh, scale in the member state. You have some uh, potential ideas there in some member states for the future to set up uh, energy centers, for instance, with, with the cohesion policy. Extremely important also, and we will hear about that later on, is uh, to make sure the TA is going up indirectly to the households, meaning that, uh, for instance, setting up one-stop shops on building renovation uh, can be really one way uh, ahead and uh, needs to be looked at uh, in, in the coming years. Next slide. Please. <clears throat> there needs to be some priorities when TA is developed. So as I said, uh, the analytical part would really uh, show where the capacities are most constrained, where they are really the issues, and uh, where the technical assistance needs are highest. This needs to be really linked up with the appetite and the readiness to take up technical assistance. Uh, that can be very uh, diverse depending on the organization. So this needs to be integrated. Uh, people need to be ready to work, for instance, with external support. Then there needs to be also political support that this will make uh, a difference over the long time. And this means especially that uh, the partnership approach and uh, the work of authorities with other authorities in the same country or across uh, Europe at regional or even national, member, uh, national level can make a big difference. And this is where also um, the use of EU technical assistance can make a big difference. And uh, in my next slide, I tried to um, show on, on, on one map the whole landscape if you can go to the next slide, of uh, the different availabilities uh, in terms of EU technical support linked to building renovation. I don't have time, I won't go into all of the um, instruments available, just to show that there are many of them, we, you will hear later on of some of, of them more, more precisely. I will just take uh, one minute to focus on the one which uh, I know best and uh, which we work on, which is the cohesion policy programs. So if we can go into the next slide, please. Um, just to emphasize that in the new cohesion policy, uh, there is even a further emphasis on capacity building with uh, even, uh, I would say, some novelties in terms of implementing flat rate technical assistance, financing not linked to costs, also the possibility for member states to develop roadmaps for administrative capacity building. And the two important points I really want to emphasize is that, uh, and Carsten will come back to, Kaspar will come back to that later on, is that we will have a specific support on building renovation with cohesion policy under the renovation wave flagship of the, of the TSI instrument. And we are also working now uh, with the World Bank on a, on a focused support on building renovation through cohesion policy with their uh, assistance. So this will be the first time ever that we will have dedicated technical assistance support uh, within cohesion policy for the managing authorities and all partners that will work with, uh, with our funding in this uh, period, so 21-27, where we expect uh, billions of euros to be dedicated to, um, to building renovation. Next slide, I will be very quick now. I think I have used my, my 10 minutes. It is, I can leave it up to you just to mention that there is really a lot of funding available for cohesion policy. You will see here by, by, by funding. It's really about, uh, I think, in total billions of euros across Europe that will be available for technical assistance. And my very last slide, the next one, is uh, just to uh, promote a toolkit that has been published recently in terms of uh, uh, roadmaps for administrative capacity building. That's it from my side, and of course, I'm happy to reply to questions later on. Many thanks. Matthew, and thanks to you for that very great overview of technical assistance from a DG Regio perspective. I was very impressed by the lessons learned. And we look forward to see how well they've been incorporated in newer instruments. So without further ado, I'm delighted to now introduce Casper uh, Richter from uh, DG Reform. Casper uh, is going to talk to us indeed about one of those instruments you mentioned, Matthew, uh, the technical support instrument from DG Reform. Casper, over to you for 10 minutes. Many thanks. Uh, great pleasure for me to be joining you at this uh, fascinating 
uh, webinar, I will be presenting the technical support instrument, which, as Messi said, is one of the instruments that can help member states in the area of technical support for building renovation. Um, I will present the instrument and then tell you a bit about what we're specifically doing in the area of building renovation. Next slide, please. So what is this instrument? What is this technical support instrument? Um, it's a follow-up program um, for the new Financial Perspective 2127. Previously, the program was called Structural Support Reform Program. It is about providing tailor-made technical support to public authorities in member states for reforms. And in that, it is really squarely integrated into the recovery plan for Europe. It's all about recovery, resilience, um, building a, re a sustainable, resilient future. It comes with a budget. The budget is um, roughly 110, 150 million euros per year over the seven year period. And that has essentially a very important implication, namely, through this budget, we are able to uh, provide the financing for experts. So member states, when they engage with us, don't need to co-finance uh, the experts. And that also means the, the funds that we have, we use directly to contract those experts. So again, member states do not have to worry about procuring experts. It's something that we do in-house. A key feature of this program is that it's purely voluntary. It's on demand. So it's up to the member states to decide, to decide, do they want to use the program and in which areas do they want to engage with DG reform? We believe that's very important because that way we assure ownership. Uh, finally, it's a very flexible instrument because it can really cover all stages of the reform process before uh, you implement a reform, the design stage, when you are trying to make a reform work in the implementation stage, and also at the end when you want to figure out whether it has worked or not. Next slide. It's also very flexible in the sense that it can really cover any area that is important for reform investments to boost growth, um, to boost jobs, um, addressing green issues, digital issues, competitive issues, social issues, and so on. Next slide. How does it actually work? Well, as mentioned, it's voluntary. So it basically starts with a request from the member state that gets submitted. We get more requests than we can cater for. So we haven't, based on our regulation, we use uh, assessment criteria to then select the best requests. And once the request is selected, we are in close touch with the member state to figure out what's the right source of expertise to mobilize in order to make that technical support a success. Should it be in-house expertise from the Commission side or should it be expertise uh, from international organizations? Should it be expertise from the market uh, through consultancy firms or private sector experts? And then uh, we put this uh, together, we define the deliverables activities, timeline, and we launch the engagement. Next slide. So um, two things are important. We basically run with annual circles, annual cycles, uh, with deadlines end of October. So we have a month away of the deadline for the TSI Taking Support Instrument 2022. Um, and then it takes us more or less until spring next year in order to put the uh, pro actual selected project on the ground. Um, so when a member state submits a request, it's important to reflect about the needs that are relevant for about uh, the next summer onwards. Next slide. So this was the introduction on um, the instrument. Now, with this instrument, we've actually already engaged in many member states in the area of building renovation. Here are a few examples. Um, and you, as you can see, um, the specific projects really differ. I think it reflects the point that technical support needs are different from one member state to another. For example, 
Ireland, Italy, Greece is more about public buildings, either scaling up our investments or helping them to put energy registries um, together on energy consumption. In the case of uh, Czechia and Poland, it's more about awareness raising, as well as um, putting up a registry for online certified energy efficiency experts. So these are more in the residential sector. In the case of Hungary, the, the project has been about um, actually both public and residential buildings putting a roadmap together for energy efficiency investment that can feed into the long-term renovation strategy. And then the last example relates to Slovenia, where it's really about a national strategy on heating and cooling. Next slide. So with this year, we've launched actually um, an, a, a series of flagship proposals, flagship technical support projects. Next slide. Uh, where we have identified common needs across member states in areas that are aligned with commission priorities. They remain, of course, purely voluntary, but because we've basically pre-filled partially the template, we facilitate member states' requests in that area. And then, of course, we still would fully tailor the specific intervention to the needs of the member state. Next slide. Now, one of these flagships, in fact, we have 13 flagships, is exactly in the area of renovation wave. So this is a flagship tailored uh, targeted at member states and regions wishing to support building renovation. It's been jointly developed with the colleagues from DG Regio, Klima and ENA. It's really, uh, of course, related to the Green Deal, the, the renovation wave, also the recovery and resilience facility, and of course, cohesion policy funding. So we hope that through this initiative, we can contribute to help member states at national regional level to achieve key reforms. Um, either by addressing some of the many barriers that hold renovation back still today by making renovation complex, expensive and time consuming. Also, uh, we hope to contribute to the green recovery with this and of course help uh, at making accessible and well-targeted cohesion policy funding. Next slide. In particular, we've uh, defined three activity packages. Um, again, that would be then specifically tailored to the specific needs of member states in each area. First of all, implementing building renovation policies in key priority areas that could be about public building, residential building, energy poverty, sustainable investments, and so on. Second activities is around um, making sure that there's an effective governance of the long-term renovation strategies, which are the key strategic tool for steering funds to building renovations in the right priorities aligned with national needs. And then thirdly, the activity package around in the area of cohesion policy, which is an essential um, fund uh, source of funding for building renovation, as we've heard from Matthew. And here uh, we offer help to member states and regions managing authorities to first of all identify barriers and needs for the effective implementation of cohesion policy funding. And then secondly, to develop and implement action plans by those authorities, including the development and methodologies and also training for public administration. Next slide. So uh, if this sounds interesting to you and you would like to know more, um, you can go to our website. There's lots of information about uh, what we have been doing in these different areas. And of course, you will also find our context points as well as the email address here on the slide. Back to you, Adrian. Thank you so much, Casper, for that very uh, clear uh, presentation of the TSI and very heartening to see how it's going to bring support to the National Recovery and Resilience Plans and their rollout. Uh, it's a good moment for me to mention that uh, Renovate Europe and the E3G have carried out an analysis of the plans and will be presenting the results of that study uh, on the 13th of October at Renovate Europe Day. Uh, it will be the most detailed analysis with individual country profiles of the place of energy renovation in the uh, recovery and resilience plans. And so great, Casper, to know that alongside uh, the member state uh, ambitions. There is the uh, financing for technical support available from the European Commission. 
So the last speaker in our first session, uh, and I remind the audience to ask questions, please, in the question box, uh, so that we can have uh, an exchange with the panelists. Um, our last speaker in this session, uh, next slide, please, is Mary Angela Lutcheri, who is uh, working with Federin, one of the co-hosts for today's event. So, Mary Angela, over to you. Good morning, all. Um, can you go to the first slide, please? Next one. Thank you. So uh, the European City Facility, or UCF, is financed by the Horizon 2020 program and is meant to uh, support local authorities in, in access uh, uh, for their financing. In particular, we provide technical, legal and financial expertise to these local authorities in the development of their sustainable energy projects. We plan to finance the development of more than 200 investment concepts. So the investment concept is a document that serves to translate a project idea into technical and financial terms so that the investor or financing institution can easily understand what the municipality wants to do and so what are the activities they are asking funds for. Um, thanks to our peer-to-peer -peer opportunities, our national webinars and also our national support, we plan to build the capacities of more than 400 public employees it shall be noted that other than the European Consortium organizing event, um, activities at European level, every country involved in the facility has what we call country experts. So either an organization or an individual with a long expertise in sustainable energy and financing that guide the uh, interested municipality through the whole process since the first approach to the facility until the access to further financing. Again, our main objective is to ease uh, access to both private and public financing for munici uh, municipalities. We do this thanks to our investment concept, but also thanks to our network of, of uh, financing institutions and investors. And also thanks to our uh, matchmaking events between the investors and uh, uh, the beneficiaries of the facility. Next slide, please. So UCF, is managed through call for applications. We have four calls, two already closed. One closed uh, last October 2020, financing uh, 30 beneficiaries. The second one closed last May, uh, selecting 69 beneficiaries. Now we have a third one uh, that will be launched soon and a fourth one that will be launched next year. Every call is simultaneously launched in three regions. We grouped Europe in uh, North and Western countries Central and East Europe countries and South Europe countries. Next slide, please. Thanks. So as mentioned, the third call will be launched uh, soon, next month in, on the 15th of October. It will be open for two months, closing on the 17th of December. We have at our disposal a budget of over 4 million euros that is meant to finance uh, 69 beneficiaries. So it's the development of 69 investment concepts in particular 26 in uh, the Central and East Europe, 24 in the North Europe, and 19 in the South Europe. Every beneficiary receives a lump sum of 60,000 euro. It is, of course, meant to finance the drafting of the investment concept, but it can also be used to finance uh, feasibility studies, legal analysis, market analysis, activities for stakeholder engagement, and so on. Uh, next slide, please. So the facility is addressed to municipalities, local authorities. They can also apply in group. And it is also open to local public entities aggregating municipalities or local authorities. So basically, low established public union of municipalities. Uh, they can apply when the call is open, of course. And if they are selected, they receive the grant and they have one year to develop all the activities they plan to. And then uh, after the delivery of the investment concept, they have two years to access further financing with our support. Next slide again, please. So as I mentioned, we already closed uh, two calls, financing uh, 99 investment concept. Um, here you can see the sector targeted by the selected applicants. Um, as you can see, most of the applications were addressing uh, buildings. So integrated renewables in buildings, public buildings, and residential buildings. Um, I just want to quickly mention uh, two examples, one coming from Spain, from five small municipalities. 
that join together to uh, develop uh, a one-stop shop model to multiply the refurbishment rate of residential building. This investment concept uh, is meant to trigger an, a further investment of more than uh, 100 million euro and help these five municipalities in uh, reaching uh, energy saving in the amount of 30 gigawatts per year. The second uh, example that I want to present to you comes from Belgium, where the Brussels region, so 19 municipalities joined together and uh, they want to uh, retrofit all the public buildings in the territory, including uh, modernization of lighting system, heating and cooling system, thermal insulation, integration of renewables, of course, and they also want to develop uh, a one-stop shop, but for uh, mainly auditing and monitoring of energy savings. This is our uh, most, um, the biggest uh, investment concept we have with the biggest impact. Um, the investment concept is meant to trigger an investment of almost 900 million euro and to help the territory in achieving uh, almost 200 gigawatts per year of energy savings. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So I just want to conclude uh, uh, this presentation presenting you with our guide on how to set up a city facility in a region or in a local territory. Um, the European city facility is mainly focusing on uh, energy supply and energy efficiency. However, what we provide in this guide is just a structure on how to successfully manage cascade funding for municipalities, especially small and medium-sized municipalities. Therefore, uh, this structure is meant to be easily uh, adapted to the regional context and so the regional and local priorities and uh, the sector targeted by these priorities. Um, that's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary Angela, and thanks to all the speakers in this panel for um, respecting the time. Maybe you might put your cameras on uh, so we can move to the questions and answers uh, session. And uh, at this moment, we don't have any questions in the um, in the chat box, but I have some questions that I would like to put to the panelists. Maybe you might come back and join me uh, by putting on your cameras. I was, is that possible? There's my Angela. Hi, Matthew and Casper. Thank you. So I, coming back to Matthew, uh, Matthew gave a very broad um, appreciation for what technical assistance is, the diversity of it and so on. But there's a point I, I maybe wanted to dig in a bit deeper with you on, and that was the working with people uh, technical assistance. I think it's something that maybe has not previously been considered an important aspect of technical assistance. But I was in Romania last week at the uh, C40 Forum event, and there I learned that, particularly for Central and Eastern European uh, region, uh, where families live in multifamily housing, uh, and the ownership structure is complicated, that technical assistance, basically sociologists who can go into those buildings and explain the concept of a renovation is crucially important. I mean, is this something that you've specifically seen over the years, that that kind of social contact is really important uh, to bring together uh, uh, support for renovation projects in such contexts? Uh, yeah, I think we this we have seen already, I would say, like uh, 10 years ago, I, I very much remember when, for instance, um, as first member states going heavily into uh, building renovation on a large scale, like uh, Lithuania uh, or Estonia 10 years ago, uh, and some other member states, one of the major issues they faced is indeed, I would say first, I mean, the acceptance, as I said, the appetite and the acceptance by um, by the people living in the flats or in the houses um, to uh, have uh, their homes renovated um, to the point that uh, I would say all the other parts of uh, a program uh, ticked the boxes and was ready to fly and to be implemented until they reached the point uh, that I would say the, the final beneficiaries were kind of forgotten or not involved enough. And then they had like to almost 
dedicate uh, several months or, or even years to convince people and to make sure the funding can flow and uh, the pro program being implemented. So it is extremely important that um, I would say the very the end beneficiary are fully involved at design stage uh, to make sure that there is this appetite and that the program which is proposed uh, is fit for purpose. And this means that especially, I would say, all the organizations and the partners, this can be a local association, civil society, um, are fully involved and can benefit from technical assistance. This is, for instance, the case under cohesion policy that the partners of a program uh, can receive funding, for instance, to get training, to build up their capacities and skills uh in in the energy sector uh to to hire experts helping them to for instance uh, work with the end beneficiaries and so on i remember for instance in that's quite old but uh slovenia did it well and uh, i think already in 2007-13 they had a, a whole technical assistance program on the cohesion policy programs where the aim was uh, to help the social economic partners of the program, so um, NGOs basically, to build up their, their capacities and uh, to really play their role in the deployment of, uh, of the funding. Uh, so yeah, I think this is really something which needs to be integrated at the design stage. And I think uh, on the cohesion policy, for instance, there is funding possibilities, so technical assistance can be used. Uh, to pay people, uh, to pay experts, to pay the build-up of, of, of expertise and capacities for all these organizations that work directly um, with, uh, with the beneficiaries in these multi-partner blocks uh, and so on. Great, Matthew. Thanks, thanks for that detail. And the questions are now beginning to flow in. Uh, and for Casper, uh, there's a specific question, uh, which is, is the deadline of the 31st of October also applicable for the flagship uh, elements of the TSI this year? And maybe I might add to that just uh, on the voluntary na nature of the investment, uh, sorry, the, the, the TSI, is the Commission ever concerned that the distribution is unequal across the 27 member states because the requests maybe are less from certain regions than others? So maybe we might talk to that distribution of the question as well as answering that precise question from our uh, participant. Thanks, Casper. Hey, thanks, Adrian. And thanks for the question from the participant. Yeah, thanks for allowing me to clarify that point. Indeed, the deadline 31st of October applies also for the flagships under this round because we will get all requests in at the same time and then we have to select. So as this is the same process applying to flagships and projects or requests outside of flagship, the deadline is exactly the same. Um, so thanks for allowing me to clarify that. Now. Um, just to say, Adrian, indeed, um, one important feature of this program is we don't have any geographic quota, right? It's essentially mm -hmm. a program that's an offer to all member states, all regions in the EU member states to make use of, and then essentially the best requests win. So the real advice is to work on quality in order to maximize your chances. Now, the experience in the past is indeed it is a competitive process. So to give you the numbers from last year, the first round under the technical support instrument, we had over 700 requests and we selected something like 220 something. So more or less one in three made it. Mm -hmm. So really key advice is if, if you're interested to submit a request, if you're a public authority of a member state, um, contact us, reach out to us when you are preparing the draft request. And then also make sure that um, your ministry is really behind it, as well as the coordinating authority in every member state that then submits all requests together to DG Reform at the end of October, is also aware of the importance of that request and makes that request a priority. Thank you. Very clear, Casper, and thanks for that. So just a last um, exchange in this uh, round. Mariangela, there's a specific question for you too, which is could you uh, identify which local authorities in Spain, maybe you can't, maybe, but you might be able to mention the region that uh, were the, your example. 
And then I see you have actually a question for the other panelists that you might pose yourself. So, Maria Angela. So the example that uh, I gave earlier was from the province of Giruna. I don't know the name of all the five municipalities involved, but they were led by the municipality of Olet. We have many more Spanish applicants, but um, to be honest, I don't know their names. I don't remember. And then your question for our commission speakers. Do you want to ask it yourself? No. Okay, Mariangela has, has asked if uh, maybe it's DG Regio or, uh, could speak more about the updates that are going to happen to the Invest EU Advisory Hub because changes are coming. So is it Matthew or is it Caspar that could quickly answer on that one? Matthew's shaking his head saying no. Caspar? Yeah, I, mean, I, can, I can start. I think Caspar could uh, add, add the word probably. Uh, just to mention that, uh, of course, I mean, there are changes uh, uh, there. The Invest EU High Advisory Hub taking up uh, a much more prominent uh, role and also, uh, for instance, in relationship to um, the ELENA support, so which is really uh, the one targeted at energy efficiency in buildings. And I think one also important uh, evolution on our side and the coordination of that. Uh, of cohesion policy and invest EU advisory hub is that uh, uh, member states or authorities um, can decide if they want so to to dedicate a part of the funding they have uh, in their programs uh, to invest EU including then uh, getting assistance to the invest EU advisory hub um, and I think this is also um, a good news and a good sign of our will in the Commission to make sure that the different assistance are coordinated and can be connected. Um, so I think this is a novelty, for instance, that uh, can be seized in the Member States uh, to make sure that uh, there is enhanced uh, coordination and synergies between the different strands of assistance that's provided. Caspar, would you like to supplement? Just to uh, also confirm that point that on our side, um, of course, we would really make sure that our support is well coordinated with, with what is happening through other channels, as Matthew said, including the InvestEU Advisory Hub. So we are closely coordinating on our support with them. Okay, so time is pressing already. Uh, thank you to the first three uh, speakers uh, for that very stimulating presentations and the exchange. Um, watch out, Renovit Europe will continue to speak about technical assistance and spread information about how to access it uh, over the months and years ahead. So thank you once again um, for your inputs. So now if we move on to the next slide, um, we're going to move to our second panel and uh, I'm delighted to present to you Peter Schilliken from our co-host organization, Energy Cities. Um, to the audience, we had hoped to show a video, but we've had a technical glitch just before the event, and the video is not uh, displaying. So Peter will say a few words because the video was from uh, an Energy Cities source. Peter, over to you for a few words. Yeah, thank you very much, Adrian. It's a great pleasure for me to be with you as a co-host of this event. And uh, yeah, Energy Cities is really promoting and lobbying technical assistance for building refurbishment since I work for Energy Cities, I would like to say so, more than 25 years already. And it was not the idea for me to give any presentation. So the idea was to show you the video on the Innovate project, which is explaining and promoting the one-stop approach, which in our point of view is a really good instrument to <coughs> accelerate and to uh, facilitate and make easier for local authorities and for, for also for the residents to renovate their buildings to have energy savings and also to to compete uh, energy poverty so it's uh, yeah it's not such a big problem because we will put the link to the video on the website maybe together with a link to the guide we have to developed on the one stop shop and there are also a few more videos we would like to share with you showing successful examples in 
supporting uh, local authorities in their way forward to <clears throat> building renovation. So there is a lot that have been said. I do not want to add many things more. What I still see as a big problem is to make <clears throat> really the renovation wave. So uh, to convince more local authorities, more national authorities and regions yet to get involved and to make use of these different funding programs, assistance programs, which are there. So um, I still have no clue how to, to motivate and to reach out for those uh, partner stakeholders who, who still uh, do not act. So that's, uh, I'm also curious to see if these aspects and how the Bank, uh, Banque de Territoire or Caisse des Depots and BPI, if they have found in their analysis some success stories, so how programs get uh, more and more successful and reach out, have a big reach out. Thanks for giving the floor. <laughs> Thank you, Peter, and thank you for your support in preparing this uh, this webinar, and indeed a very good um, introductory remarks for the next two speakers. So, without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce the audience to uh, Caroline François Marsal, who comes from the Caisse de Depot Group. Uh, Caroline, uh, the floor is yours to speak to us about the work of the Caisse de Depot in this uh, technical assistance field. Ten minutes. Yes, um, many thanks, Adrian. Uh, so indeed, I work as a policy officer within uh, Caisse des Depots Group in Brussels. And so before um, talking to you about the local technical assistance we provide for building renovation and including in the context of the green recovery, uh, I would like maybe to explain very quickly what we do and, and who we are. Um, so we are a French promotional institution in France uh, with the status of NPDI, so National Promotion Institutional Bank, as our partners in, in the EU, the KFW or Casa Depositi. And so what we do is that we are long-term investor, um, basically dedicated to general interest. And to do so, we finance territorial economic development projects uh, in France through uh, equity and loans. <clears throat> and in several uh, sectors identified as priority uh, at uh, both national and EU level. Uh, so among those sectors, we can think of the uh, green and digital transition, uh, the social housing uh, skills or, or the social economy. Uh, so all these sectors tend to contribute to social cohesion. So if we can move on to the next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, so indeed, the, um, the Caisse des Depots has a, a strong role in, uh, in housing and building in France. And so uh, this is that we have been historically financing uh, the sector of social housing. So as you can see, we have 160 billion euros of total loan outstanding dedicated to the, the construction and the renovation of social housing. And um, in this uh, total amount, there are loans that are specifically dedicated to thermal renovation uh, of buildings, which is the ECOPRE, with an interest rate of 0%. We also intervene in the local public sector, so to finance municipalities, hospitals, or universities' buildings. And uh, same uh, as before, we have uh, financing, which is dedicated to the thermal renovation of public buildings, uh, notably through the, um, the Grand Plan d'Investissement, which is uh, an agreement that was signed uh, with the national authorities in 2018 uh, to provide financing uh, with uh, a loan, uh, Prêt uh, Ambre, and um, Interacting, which, is, which are basically repayable advances uh, which are reimbursed via um, energy efficiency um, gains. So these are the two sectors uh, in which we intervene and our means of, of intervention are, are uh, multiple as well. So uh, the Caisse des Depots and Banque des Territoires is organized uh, via uh, multiple regional departments uh, which are anchored in the several territories uh, in France. That allows us to provide support to uh, local authorities in territories. We lend uh, as well uh, on uh, saving funds. We invest via equity, 
and we also finance technical support, so which is the point that we will go through today. Um, maybe it is to be noted that two of our subsidiaries also provide uh, directly technical support, but mostly it is uh, financing. Uh, so all these um, capacities of action have been uh, reinforced uh, last year via the Caisse des Depots Climate Plan that we can see in the in the next slide. Um, thanks. So in uh, 2020, uh, Caisse des Depots and BPI France, which is our subsidiary dedicated to SMEs, have launched um, a climate plan in the context of the National Recovery Plan uh, France Relance, which was launched after in reaction to, to COVID. Um, so this plan uh, dedicated to climate consists of uh, 40 billion euros to be used uh, from 2020 to 2024. And basically half of this uh, total amount will be dedicated to accelerate the transition of companies and territories and to finance support solutions. So what is important here is that uh, the plan of uh, Caisse des Depots and BPI France comes in complementarity of uh, France Relance. So that means concretely that, for instance, when um, France Relance will bring a subsidy to, to, to finance the renovation of a public building, for instance, we will uh, come and bring a loan in order to, uh, to massify the capacity of financing uh, on the field. Uh, and so, of course, this um, reinforcement of capacity is important because uh, the challenges of, uh, of, of thermal renovation in France is important as it, um, the emissions of, uh, issued by the building sector uh, represent one third of the, the complete amount of CO2 emissions in France. Um, so on the next slide, uh, I would just like to quickly recap the um, the how does the French ecosystem of thermal renovation uh, of buildings uh, looks and uh, just remind you that we as Caisse des Depots intervene mostly on public housing that means social housing and social and affordable housing and on public tertiary uh, which are public buildings of local authorities and of the state. Uh, so I will not uh, mention today uh, private housing and private tertiary. Um, so, on the next slide, thank you, um, we can now jump in into what uh, the technical support provided by Caisse des Depots uh, looks like. So, we basically, uh, the, the idea of uh, the role of the Caisse des Depots group is to uh, identify market failures on territories and to bring solutions to them. So what we have identified is that um, local authorities uh, lack uh, the technical and also the financing means to address uh, the, reno the thermal renovation uh, challenges of buildings today. So, so what we do is that at national level, we come and contribute to the conception, the implementation and the follow-up of national policies of energy renovation of buildings. And we do that in link with the other administrations such as ministries and the um, Agency for the Environment and the Energy, ADEM. We also provide financing. Uh, so as mentioned earlier, via interacting and loans. And um, at regional and local level, so the network of regional depart departments will uh, bring support to the um, local authorities to ensure uh, they can go through the, the, their renovation projects, basically. So, so our support can be um, identified with three main stages. First one being to advise the local authority. So to do that, we come and co-finance a pre-project study that is basically an energy audit of the, um, the building the local authority wants to renovate. The second step is to bring financing, so through loans and interacting. And the third step will be uh, to ensure um, a proper monitoring of uh, the, uh, the project of renovation uh, to assess uh, the uh, energy consumption after the renovation works are done and that is done through a, a national platform uh, accessible. Um, so maybe on the next slide, we can also um, 
take a, a more concrete example and focus on a plan that was uh, launched uh, recently on uh, on how to to best renovate uh, schools in France. So it's called the uh, Mille Écoles Action Cœur de Ville, and it has the objective to launch 1,000 projects of thermal renovation by 2022. So this plan is actually part of a larger national program, which is called Action Cœur de Ville. Um, so it's a national program that is implemented by Caisse des Dépôts, uh, Banque des Territoires in France, and which aims at uh, revitalizing the city centers of middle-sized municipalities in France. So within this program, uh, we here launched this plan, uh, which so uh, will benefit to the uh, the municipalities that are within uh, the, the the program action Cœur de ville and which targets um, the buildings of kindergarten and primary schools as well as all the buildings that are used for school needs more generally so uh, the canteens the libraries portals and uh, anything else linked to educational estates uh, so what this plan does is that it allows us to increase our amount of technical assistance credits uh, granted to local authorities. So where before we used to finance, uh, for instance, a pre-project study up to 50%, we will now increase it to up to 100%. And so, of course, this uh, is important as uh, the schools represent a large part of the um, uh, public building uh, estate. Uh, so if we go on the next slide, we can run quickly through the, um, the six steps of the support uh, that is put in place uh, in this plan. Uh, so the, the first one is to sensitize the, the local authority uh, on the uh, challenges around uh, the renovation uh, of buildings using an energy comparator tool. Then we inform the local authority uh, on the energy consumption of the estate it would like to, to renovate. Uh, then uh, the next step is to help it decide. So uh, with building uh, an estate strategy, uh, decide how to plan investments and identify the priorities of financing. Uh, we help her program the, the renovation works. Uh, we bring financing, so uh, the, as always, the loans and the interacting uh, uh, financing. And finally, the, the monitoring of the renovation project to pilot and measure the energy efficiency gains afterwards. Um, yes, so that's it for me. Many thanks. Uh, merci, Caroline. Thank you for that uh, clear presentation. And very interesting to see that marriage of financing and technical support being carried out uh, in France uh, to, to various public uh, uh, bodies and public buildings. And uh, I was particularly impressed, maybe we can come back to it in the Q&A, uh, of, of the fact that monitoring takes place uh, as well afterwards to verify, I guess, that you're matching the climate plan uh, objectives. But uh, before we come back to the discussion, let's move forward to our last speaker, uh, who is uh, Jesse Glicker from uh, BPIE, Building Performance Institute Europe. Uh, Jesse is going to bring us back to, uh, back to earth with a presentation on policy, because you're going to talk to us about how technical assistance uh, should be considered in the context of the revisions of the Buildings Directive. And at the Renovate Europe campaign, we're, of course, centrally focused on that revision and interested in, for example, minimum energy performance standards, which will be a re reform in most member states that could be supported by the TSI that we saw at the start. So, Jessica, maybe you draw these strands together in your presentation. So, over to you. Absolutely. Thanks. And thanks so much. It's been really great to hear from the other speakers and really see some project in action and see all of the different options that are out there right now for technical assistance. Um, so I'll, just taking a step back, I'm Jesse Glicker from BPIE. Um, I'm a project manager here working on technical assistance. Um, and we can head to the next slide. I'll do a little bit of presentation on what we do at BPIE. Um, we're a European nonprofit think tank. Um, so as Adrian said, we do policy advice on building regulation from design to implementation. Um, we have our two main offices in Brussels and Berlin with a few consultants throughout the rest of Europe. Um, and 
our main goal is improving the energy performance of buildings across Europe. Um, we can go to the next slide. Perfect, yep. So just a bit more about our, our key mission, um, actionable data-driven analysis, timely and efficient support, and cutting edge thought leadership. So um, really the thought, the work on technical assistance that we're doing at the moment falls into this category of thought leadership as you know, the, um, technical assistance is really gaining more momentum and interest throughout the EU, especially in planning. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the EPBD revision and the role that technical assistance plays there. But I think it's quite important right now to consider, you know, this the new wave of technical assistance that we're seeing. Uh, next slide. So just a little bit more about BPIE's work on technical assistance at the moment. Um, so we're going to talk about the EPBD recommendations, uh, but then also we've got two papers coming out this fall. The first, um, benchmarking for energy efficiency, is a larger project we did, um, and we did have a look at technical assistance, wrote, writing a concept paper about some of the main available um, mechanisms, technical assistance mechanisms that we've seen and we've heard about today. and also a paper for our Build Upon Squared project, which is a Horizon 2020 project, um, where we're specifically looking at the needs of local authorities. So we contacted all of the pilot projects, we had eight pilot projects throughout the EU uh, to really see what kind of technical assistance they need in order to implement a framework to uh, measure the benefits of renovation in their cities. Um, and then we're working on another concept paper based on all of this work to really summarize the recommendations um, that we've come to with all of these different projects um, and to really have discussions with the different key players in offering technical assistance, what's needed in technical assistance. Um, and we will definitely get to that um, toward the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. Um, so as I mentioned, we recently published a paper on making the EPBD fit for 2030. Um, so among the recommendations, we did have a focus on technical assistance, um, and in particular, this idea of a technical assistance framework. Uh, so really a TA framework to, cl to clarify the options and process for accessing technical assistance, what that should look like across member states, um, what is available, and really how to access it. Um, and something that the previous speakers have said over and over, which is a very key point, is you know we really need technical assistance to deliver, um, to deliver on our 2030 targets, but also really uh, to triple the renovation rate. Uh, so really, when you look at what is needed to triple the renovation rate, technical assistance is a huge facilitator. Um, we've seen throughout the morning that there is a lot of available funding. There's a lot of programs out there. Um, and it's really about how we can make TA so that we can access those programs and that funding. Um, and one of the other things we did come to, one of the conclusions we came to is to really clarify the current available technical assistance options and be very clear about the eligibility requirements. Um, so there's more on that paper uh, available on the website and you'll, this will be circulated after. So feel free to have a look. Uh, next slide. So we've heard about several different aspects um, from the previous speakers this morning. Um, and these are just a few of the key initiatives and measures up that, that are underway at the moment that have referenced technical assistance. Um, so really here, you know, we're looking at the Green Deal, we're looking at the renovation wave, um, the MFF, you know, all of these different things. And, you know, I've just kind of categorized them here, strategic communication, budget, funding support. Um, so all of these different things that are talking about technical assistance and yet um, the polling question that we started with, I think is a, a key question to consider is what do people consider technical assistance? Um, we're looking at project development support, we're looking at financial support, application support. Um, and I think until we have a very clear understanding of the different definitions of technical assistance and what we need, um, it'll be hard to address technical assistance and how to essentially fix all the, the available resources uh, to make them incredibly useful to tripling the renovation rate. Uh, next slide. So I won't read through all of this because it's quite word dense, but um, basically some of the key recommendations that we've come up with based on all of this research um, is the need for clarity. So I had mentioned on the previous slide, really a, a real understanding with a definition 
on what we're looking, what we're talking about when we're talking about technical assistance. Um, so here we've split up the recommendations into recommendations for the European level and recommendations for the member state level. Um, so of course, there's quite a bit of overlap. And um, I think it was Matthew who said, you know, it's not a one size fits all solution. You really have to understand the local context. Um, you really have to know what's happening at the local level, what's happening at the member state level, what's already on option. Um, but I think there's certainly tools that can help, um, especially knowledge sharing, like webinars like this, where we're hearing about different projects, where um, we're seeing different projects in action. Um, I think that's incredibly useful to see how fit for purpose those things are and how they can be translated and used across member states. Um, but I will highlight here the, the two recommendations at the bottom. So on the European side, it's create a directory of programs available, um, which includes eligibility requirements, timelines, contact information. So, um, you know, one of the things that we heard about today, especially with the TSI, which is incredibly useful, um, is really an understanding of how to access that money, how to, um, how to apply, when to apply. Um, and I think given all of the, the plethora of options that we've, we've heard about and we know about, um, something like this is incredibly important and useful. Um, and then on the member state level, this a national or local liaison, and I believe, although um, you know, I've seen many TSI presentations and they're, they're incredibly useful, I believe that's similar to the TSI model, um, really someone who can help on the local or national level navigate the system um, and help local authorities apply for technical assistance. So a bit of a mini technical assistance expert to help with technical assistance. Um, we can go to the next slide. And so finally, I just, I think there's some key questions that we need to ask. So keeping in mind tripling the renovation rate in Europe um, is really how we have to frame the conversation of technical assistance. Um, who is responsible for addressing the key issues surrounding technical assistance, including clarification? Um, and when we have multiple programs, you know, I think sometimes it feels like we're in this labyrinth of options. Um, and it can be quite hard to take a step back and see who's eligible, what exactly it is that you're looking for. Is it project development? Is it financing? Is it application assistance? Um, and really, what is the way forward? Is it, um, are we looking at our current system and trying to figure out our current system and offerings? Or is it something else that we need to be considering? What is our ideal framework that we need to be moving toward? And how can we sort of pull apart the current options to fit an ideal framework that would really be, um, that would really help in our goals for tripling the renovation rate in Europe. Um, and I think one of the things that we need to keep in mind is, you know, really what is the potential of technical assistance? And we've talked about that a little bit and I, with the EU cities facilities, you know, this um, monitoring, tracking, really being able to see the impact of the support that's being offered, I think is something that's incredibly important. And maybe if we were able to, better understand the, the potential, um, we would have a, a more of a focus on what is needed in terms of our technical support framework and um, systems. And I believe that's the last slide. It was quite fast, sorry, but we can make up for time and still have time for questions. Jesse, thank you very much for that uh, overview. Um, it, it brought to mind um, a question for me. Um, are our technical assistance instruments too numerous and too complicated? And maybe if the other panelists, so that's uh, Caroline and Peter, could turn on their cameras. It's just a question that you who are closer to the local level might be able to also cast some light on. And then we have a couple of questions from the floor that I'll come back to. But Jesse, do we have too many instruments? Is it too, too, too crowded? It's a, it's a good question. It's a tricky question because I do think um, you know, we have a plethora of options and it, it's way better to have too many options than not enough options. But I do think there is a, a large level of overlap and lack of coordination between what is available. Um, and so I think that that sometimes can make the system seem a bit too crowded um, when it's unclear. And then instead of, you know, people are, I think, spending too much time trying to weed through the options instead of having it be very clear. This is for this. This is for this. When the programs are overlapping and and it seems a bit messy. Mm -hmm. Peter, what do you think? Yeah, I absolutely share. I think that there's too much overlap. There's also so much information available and 
get some guidance through what types of program is available is is also very much needed and there are too many redevelopments so it's really uh, maybe a good proposal to to get more coordinated in in these uh, different programs which uh, assistant programs which are made available and then maybe go for a more systematic approach so that we really go i would like say town hall by town hall uh, to, mm -hmm. to have this reach out and not to focus on redevelop uh, programs or profile these, but to have a, a systematic uh, rollout strategy. So that's mm -hmm. what I call for. And Caroline, for you, there are a couple of questions that have come in from the audience. Um, so you could tackle the question I asked and, and, and I'll read the other questions to you. Um, what is meant by interacting? because that seems to be a made up word. And also, does the Casa Depot act on private home renovation technical assistance through, for example, one-stop shops? And, and I suppose maybe sometimes one-stop shops are provided as a public service in France, uh, because of course, that it, it is a public interest too to do private homes. So, Caroline, over to you. Okay. Uh, many thanks for the question. So regarding the, the first one on the multiplicity of technical support instruments, uh, I would say I completely agree uh, with Peter and, and Jesse saying that co more coordination is needed, but also taking into account uh, maybe that there needs to, um, uh, to be uh, multiple instruments to also answer different uh, market failures. Uh, so for instance, our role uh, as a NPBI in France is to maybe uh, bring uh, financing and technical support in uh, on like smaller projects than would uh, our partner like the EIB for instance. And so of course there will be then a multiple offer uh, of, of technical support on this because we need to, to answer differently. Uh, so yes, that, that would be the maybe the nuance I would bring to, to, to the answer. Uh, so to answer you on uh, interacting, so in, interacting basically is, is a financing offer dedicated to the, the renovation of public building that we also actually implemented thanks to our partnership with Energy Cities, so which I uh, think here again. Uh, and so the, the concept is that um, basically we uh, lend money in advance to the local authority, uh, which uh, basically thanks to the renovation works, uh, it will be able to uh, repay because of the uh, gain efficiencies, gain of energy efficiency made. So this is a, a sort of a circle approach that uh, the money is landed in advance and then reimbursed thanks to the energy gains. Um, so, and I think the third question was on the one-stop shop facilities. Um, so uh, I would probably come back to you later on that because I think we have implemented that on uh, private housing, but I'm quite actually not an expert on this uh, field. So I will get back to you in any way I can uh, after the, the event. Okay, um, we're already uh, coming close to the end of the time we had, um, we had assigned for the event. So uh, maybe it might be uh, good to have um, last reactions. I mean, the reality is that, and Jesse, Jesse, you said it, we need to triple the renovation rate. And in the same way as we say, <clears throat> you cannot achieve climate objectives without um, uh, addressing energy waste in buildings. I wonder if each of you just speak to the thought, I mean, we cannot uh, increase rate and depth of renovation without technical assistance. It's absolutely crucial. I mean, would you agree? And, uh, in a, in, and I expect you do, but in doing so, um, are, are there key specifics for energy renovation that you would highlight from this plethora uh, of technical assistance instruments that we've uh, heard about this morning? And I'll just come back across my screen, Jesse, Peter, Carolina, and we can draw conclusions then. So, Jesse, you're muted, Jesse. Thank you. Yeah, I no, I 100% agree that we really need to be tripling the renovation rate um, and technical assistance is crucial for that. Um, I think some of the, I mean, to address the question of sort of what technical assistance programs really um, 
and there are several out there. The Elena facility, of course, is one of them. And looking at the potential of national hubs for Elena is, is really a proven model, I think, that would be quite useful moving forward. Um, so I think looking at some of the proven solutions um, as opposed to having to totally redo the system, I think is incredibly important um, to see, you know, what's out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think we, we need uh, more networking and more coordination by those people who are running the, the technical assistance programs so that uh, we are better coordinated. This is something we we as energy cities or you as Euro A's uh, have, have to do. Maybe, and maybe we have to take an uh, initiative to get a more coordinated approach and to have a, a wider and better rollout. And I think also that banks that uh, do the bridge to Caroline uh, play an important role as they do the financing of uh, local authorities in many ways so they can also sensitize maybe more than even we uh, the local authorities because that's their daily business to to rent them money for building construction building innovation so they maybe have to take more responsibilities in the future as well so. Caroline Yes, I mean, I would uh, clearly elaborate on what Peter has said, meaning that uh, in the, at the difference with like, for instance, a commercial bank, we, we make sure that the, the financing is well channeled and that there is a, a sufficient uh, capacity of, of the well, local authority in that case to, to go through its renovation project. So this is a support that comes in complementarity with the financing that is provided. And that is mainly our added value, I guess, uh, in, in the territories and on, on the markets. So yes, I would say that, of course, uh, it is crucial to uh, uh, massify the capacity of financing to reach the renovation building targets set uh, at EU and, and national levels, but uh, it cannot go without uh, a sufficient and well um, tailored uh, technical support uh, with that, because otherwise, uh, uh, as we mentioned earlier, of course, um, actors need to be aware of the sources of financing and to be uh, sufficiently uh, formed to, to use them and uh, to ensure that the renovation works are uh, well efficient in the end. Great, Caroline. Thank you for, for that reply. And thank you to all the panelists in this second uh, round. Uh, we've, we've come to the end of the presentations. So it's my... Um, turn to thank the audience for uh, participating, for being with us this morning. I hope that you've learned uh, how important a role technical assistance can play in achieving not just the long-term climate goals of the European Union, but also specifically how to achieve a greater rate and depth of renovation uh, in our building stock. Given that the building stock consumes in its operational phase 40% of all energy uh, produced in Europe and emits 36% of uh, CO2, it's clear that we simply must address that energy use or that energy waste in buildings because we know that we can improve the performance of buildings dramatically through available technologies, uh, through available processes uh, in the market. So <clears throat> having coherent, cogent, uh, and diverse technical assistance is clearly necessary and I think it is our hope that moving forward our understanding and knowledge of what the technical assistance instruments can and must do will grow and therefore they will become more widely used. In Matthew Fisher's uh, presentation he showed a very useful slide which indicates that at European level we've appreciated that you must include technical assistance with funding programs. And that slide showed the percentage of each of the programs uh, varying, I think, from 1.5% to 4% that uh, are included in renovation, in funds for technical assistance. So to the audience, thanks again to the speakers, wonderful presentations. Everything will go up on our website uh, in the coming days so the audience can reassess and reaccess uh, the, the PowerPoint and this recording. So with that, thank you once again for joining us and I hope you've learned uh, from this morning's session. Have a great day. Bye.